Welcome to Springville City Cash Handling Training. You will be tested on this information at the end, so feel free to pause and review an individual slide if needed. We will start with the training objectives. Understand and be able to discuss the skills and knowledge areas required to be a competent city cash handler. Complete check, cash, and credit and debit card transactions according to the banking industry specifications. Perform all the specific duties of a cash handler in compliance with the standards set by the Treasurer's Office. Demonstrate a knowledge of security and loss prevention procedures. Your job is a cash handler. There is no such thing as just a cash handler or cashier. You are very important to the city. In fact, you are the city. Most of the positions in the city do not actually meet customers very often, but as a cashier, you will meet customers every single day. Essential expectations. You need to establish and maintain good customer relations to receive from and pay out money to customers. To perform cash handling operations according to established procedures. To balance your cash daily. To protect the assets of the city through sound loss and prevention practices. And to assist in other cash handling activities as directed by your supervisor. Receiving. You are expected to perform accurately and efficiently when processing customer transactions, accepting a payment, or making change. Security and loss prevention. You are expe expected to safeguard city funds against loss. You should also be familiar with what to do in the time of emergency, such as being confronted with a robbery, fire, or natural disaster. In these circumstances, protecting human life should be your first concern. Establishing good customer relations. You, you are expected to establish and maintain good customer relations. This includes professional job performance as well as being friendly pol and polite. Receiving monies. There are three different ways in receiving monies. One is the hand-to-hand -hand method, which is taking the money from one hand to the next hand. Then there's the hand-to-table method, which is taking the money from your hand to the table. And then there's the walk-through method, where you have a clip of money and you walk through the money this way. If the pile contains more than one denomination, count the largest denomination first. Place the pile in one hand and transfer one bill at a time from one hand to the other hand as you count. Look at each bill as you count to check for identifying elements on each. Check each bill as you count to ensure correct denomination. Make the hand-to-hand -hand count your second count. If your totals do not agree, repeat until they do. Okay, the hand-to-table method. This method is like the hand-to-hand -hand method, only that you place it on the table rather from one hand to the next. And then, at, and of course, the transaction is not complete until the customer agrees that the change was counted back correctly. A lot of paces don't count the change back, but at Springville City, I feel like it's really important that we count the change back. If you ever go to a, a restaurant or, you know, McDonald's or something, they just hand you your change. I think it's safer for us as a city, and I also think it's a customer service thing if we actually count the change back to the customer. And then the walkthrough method is, you know, you have all the bills face up and you just flip through them with your finger. You place the stack of bills on a table face up. All bills should be face up and in the same direction. Each stack should only contain one denomination. And then you use your thumb and your forefinger on one hand to lift back the corner of each bill. Then you use the thumb and forefinger of the other hand to hold back and count the counted bill. Check each bill as you count to ensure correct denomination. Remain vigilant and to the possibility that the corner of a bill of a larger denomination may have been taped onto the corner of a bill of a similar denomination. This is called raised notes and since um, we have the technology of printers that are very sophisticated, the raised notes are really not as common as they used to be, but they did used to do that. They used to tape a, a, a $100 bill on a $1 bill, so 
you have to just pay attention. Count the pile twice. If your totals do not agree, repeat the count until they do. Stack the pile in order with the highest denomination on the bottom and the smallest denomination on the top. This is according to banking industry standards. Recognizing currency. So who is on the $1 bill? George Washington, the Great Seal of Pyramid is on the one. Who's on the $2 bill? Thomas Jefferson, the signing of the Declaration of Independence. The five, Abraham Lincoln and the Lincoln Memorial. Who's on the 10? Alexander Hamilton and the US Treasury. The 20, Andrew Jackson and the White House. The $50 is Ulysses S. Grant and the US Capitol. And then the 100, of course, Benjamin Franklin and the Independence Hall. It's important that you know what is on each of those bills because that helps you when you're counting it that you get the right, the right totals and that somebody doesn't slip you a, a $10 and you count it as 100. Steps in to receive currency and coins. You always keep the money received in the view of the customer until the transaction is complete. Never place money received in the cash drawer before the transaction is complete. Separate the currency from the coins. Count the currency before the coins. Separate and count each currency denomination separately. So if you have fives, tens, ones, you put all the ones together, all the fives together, the tens, and you count them all separately. And you also separate coins into denomination and count each coin denomination separately. Count all currency and coin in the presence of the customer, especially if asked to give change for larger bills. Verify the grand total against the amount listed on your billing or invoice or, or whatever charge that you're, you're getting from the customer. If any discrepancy exists between your total and the customer's total, count the money again. If the discrepancy still exists, ask a co-worker to count the money. Put away the currency and coins from the last transaction before starting a new transaction and as currency is a major carrier of germs, it is recommended that you wash your hands frequently. Making change. Change should be counted at least two times. Once when the cash handler counts it out of the cash drawer and a second time when the cash handler counts it back to the customer. As I said earlier, at Springville City, we don't just hand people their change and say, here's your change. You need to count it back. At least the, the currency you need to change, count back. Okay, recognizing your currency. There's a lot of different distinguishing things in, the, in our, our bills right now. This is a picture of a $20 bill. You've got your security thread. You have your watermark that should match. We've had counterfeit $100 bills where the watermark was really, really um, not clear and you couldn't tell. It was really out of focus. So if you need to, you can look for the, for the watermark. Another thing that counterfeiters have had a hard time um, counterfeiting is the color shifting ink. As you can take the bill and you can turn it, it will change colors. And that way you know that it's, pro that it's, a, it's a good bill. I've been to a store before and I, I noticed that the, I gave the girl a $20 bill and she got out her pen and she marked, marked it. Those pens do not work. It's looking for acid in the fabric of the currency, but they really don't really detect any, they, they really don't work if the bill has been washed. So the best thing that you do can do is all she needed to do as she was taking that bill from me to put it into the cash drawer was she just needed to turn it to see if the ink shifted on the bottom right corner. So that is a good way to see if it is not a counterfeit bill. We have had counterfeit bills here at Springville City before. We don't get them very often, but once in a while we do. So be diligent in looking at the bill. Hold it up, look at the watermark, look at the color shifting ink. 
checks and check cashing. There, these are the types of checks that we will accept. Personal checks, company checks, cashier's checks, personal money orders, and traveler's checks. But the traveler's checks need to say U.S. and currency. So make sure that it says that if it is a, ca a traveler's check. The parts of a check, you always have the current date, the payee, the payer, the dollar amount, the bank, the signature, and the MICR numbers on the bottom of the check. Many people will print their own checks now, but just make sure that on the very bottom of the check it has the routing number, which is the first nine digits, and then usually the account number is right after that. Check negotiability. It is the policy of the City of Springville not to accept post-dated check. City policy requires that all checks be deposited within 72 hours of being received from a customer. Ask the customer to change the date and initial. No two-party checks will be accepted. We cannot take a check if it's made out to someone's sister or mother or whoever it is. We cannot accept those. It is against state law. And no checks drawn on foreign currency should be accepted. Um, of course, they are on non-U.S. banks. They have to say U.S. dollars clearly printed on the check. And we do not give cash back um, for checks. Checks must be made out for the exact amount. Check fraud. Pay attention to checks drawn on non-local banks and request to see identification. If practical, we can verify the funds by phone. We used to be able to do this, but lately the banks have really become, um, I don't know, secure and they won't let us verify funds anymore. Examine the date, make sure it's the right date, that it's not in the future or that it's three days ago. Be sure the check clearly shows the name, branch, city, and state where the drawee bank is located. And then confirm that the numerical amount agrees with the written amount. Um, we do have a bank. Some banks do not check those things, but our bank does. And we have had the bank send back checks that were the difference of a penny. They will look at the written amount and that's what they'll go by. So if it's off a little bit of cents or even um, $100, whatever, just make sure that it is correct. And then it should be in blue or black ink because they do uh, copy those now and so it should be in that ink. Have customers make checks payable to the city of Springville. Of course, Springville Parks is okay, Springville Courts, but just make sure it does have Springville in the written part. And then of course, no change back. And then beware of newer accounts. On a check, it will say the month and the year that that checking account was open. And if it was just open last week or, you know, last month or something, you might want to make sure you get some identification. And then um, sometimes checks will have safety features on them. And if they do, it's a good idea to kind of look at those and make sure they look right. Okay, credit card transactions. Okay, um, point of sale means that they're actually giving you the credit card and make sure that the card, take the card, slide the card, have the customer sign, ask for identification. You don't have to do this. I think it's a customer service thing to ask for identification. When I go to a place of business and they ask me identification for my credit card, I kind of appreciate that because that is a safety for, um, for, you know, helps against fraud. Compare the signatures on the back of the card and then make sure you hand the card back to the customer. And if you're having any telephone payments, um, manually enter the information into the terminal, the computer, if they're calling over the phone and you're just entering it in. But do not write down the credit card number. It, in order to be PCI compliant, we should never ever have credit card numbers written down. Okay, opening cash drawer or setup. Arrange your coin and currency in a consistent manner. 
Verify the dollar amount of beginning cash. If you're supposed to start out with $50, make sure you have $50. If you're starting with $100, make sure you have $100. And then if you do have alarm, make sure it is functional. Not very many places in Springville do we have that, but there is a couple, so make sure that they do, they are functional. Uh, custodial responsibility of cash handlers. All cash handlers shall be certified by the treasurer's office by completing this training session. All cash handlers should have a solid knowledge base and be in compliance with their departments and the city's policies and procedures issued by their departments and approved by the city treasurer. Cash handlers have the responsibility for all cash that will be processed by the cash handler. Custodial responsibility means a cash handler who has received money is liable for that money until the money is deposited, transferred to the bank, city treasurer, or placed in the vault. During cash handler hours of operation, if the cash drawer ever begins to get full, which happens rarely, but sometimes it does, transfer larger currency from your, from your cash drawer to a safe or another secure place, lock the drawer when you're away from it for any time. If you need to go to the restroom and you're responsible for that cash drawer, you need to make sure that it is locked. Lock all cash and coins in a safe. Never leave the cash drawer unattended. If you're gonna be away, make sure it's locked and don't just walk away. And when I say lock all cash and coins in a safe, we did at one time have a cashier that put money in a safe did not lock the safe and then that night it was burglarized and they were able to get the money without even having to break the safe. So it is, you do have to not just put it in the safe, but you actually have to lock the safe also. And then don't let anybody touch the drawer except for the person to which it is assigned to. Um, so if somebody says, oh, I want to make some change, you make the change for them. Don't allow them to just go get their own change. Losses and shortages. A shortage is unintentional collection errors such as making change. Overage occurs when a cash handler has collected too much money. And then a loss is due to reasons like negligence and act of God or unlawful action. Cannot deposit the money into the tre city treasury. Balancing a cash drawer. You should remove all cash currency credit and debit card receipts and checks. Count currency and coin and list by denomination on the daily cash reconciliation sheet. Cash handlers should add all checks and credit and debit card receipts and transfer the totals to the reconciliation sheet. Cash handlers should then buy from the remaining cash on hand to bring the change fund back to the preferred mix of currency and change denomination. If you want to, you can count your, if you started out with $50 and you want to count out your $50 first, you can do that. You can do it either way, but you do need to make sure that you do have what you started out with in your cash drawer. Balancing and daily revenue slips. If you, when you do have a revenue slip that you turn in the money to the city treasurer, you should, it should include the date, the signature of the preparer, the collecting location, so if it's at the swimming pool, the golf course, wherever you are, the total sales amount, over and short amounts, if different than the Z-tape, and then the Z-tape from the cash register, and the credit card settle tape. So make sure those things are included when you put them in the bag and turn them in. Locating differences. Recount the coin and currency. Do not roll coin. Our bank will not take rolled coins, so don't take the time to roll your coin. Just count your coin and put it in the bag. Check beginning cash figure. Rerun all your figures. Search the cash handling area, remove drawer, check waste basket in the area for papers relating to the daily transactions. Believe it or not, we have thrown checks in the garbage cans, so it is a good idea if you don't, if something's missing, to make sure you check the, the waste basket. 
Common errors causing out of balance situations. If you are not writing legibly, that could be it. Taking currency out of a strap without breaking the strap. Currency is put in straps, $25 bills. If you put a strap on there and then you take money out, then it might not be the amount that you think it is. Writing ending, ending cash down incorrectly. Handling transactions improperly. Picking up figures incorrectly. Clipping and wrapping currency incorrectly. We really don't wrap currency. The banks do, but we usually don't here. Dropping part of a transaction in the trash. Like I said, we have had checks that have gone into the garbage can. And not for verifying check totals with two tapes. Cash getting stuck behind the cash drawer. That's actually happened too. Not clearing the adding machine before you're using it. That happens more often than you think. You need to make sure when you're going to add up your checks that you have a zero before you start. And transposing numbers. That happens quite often. And mixing transactions between multiple drawers. Hard to find errors. Not keeping currency separated by each denomination in the cash drawer. I know that there's some people that will put the put fives in ones. I've gone and I've checked people and they've had their, their fives in their ones and tens in the wrong place. Make sure they're all in the same place so that you're not picking out, uh, a, a, you think you're picking out a one to give change back and you're actually giving a 10 because it was in the wrong place in the drawer. Sacrificing accuracy for speed. Sometimes you go too fast and then you make a mistake on your on your accepting of cash or you're counting change back and you're going too fast. Not putting money away immediately after completing a transaction. A lot of times when I first get somebody and they're, they're, I'm training them and they have their money out, then they'll try to help another person before putting the money back. Make sure the money goes back before you help anyone else. And then not locking the cash drawer when leaving the workstation. You need to make sure that you have a key and that you lock it. And then forgetting to make change. That can happen also. Not counting money twice when paying it out. That's why we want to count the money back to the customer because you're going to take it out of the cash drawer and then you're going to count it back to the customer. And that way you can know that you've made the correct change. Not completely finishing a transaction before you're starting a, a next one. We talked about that. Adding up cash and checks in your head instead of using an adding machine. I don't know about you, but I depend on an adding machine. <laughs> Can't add that good in my head anymore. Not looking at the cash that as you are paying it out. If you think you've you've taken a, a, a $1 bill out of, your, out of your cash drawer and it's actually a 10 and you're not even looking at it, that's why you need to make sure that you know what the currency is and what who's on that currency so that you're looking at it as you're counting it out. And allowing yourself to be distracted during a transaction and not changing an invoice or an amount uh, for partial cash payments. If you said it's going to be $20 and then you decide, oh, wait a minute, I think that's only $15, you need to make sure that you change that in the register or an invoice or whatever it is that you're taking money for. Allowing documents or money to fall in a trash, trash receptacle. Okay, security procedure and loss prevention. How to prevent a robbery. Have numerous people in and around the location. Try not to be the only one there. And have staff be aware of suspicious people. And then keep customers away from the cashier's workspace behind a barrier. I mean, if you're behind, all of the cash places right now in the city are behind a barrier, and you need to make sure that not anybody can just come behind that barrier. Make sure that they stay on the other side. Okay, how to prevent a robbery continue. Have a secure cash box or safe. All cash items and cashier areas should remain locked. Never allow unauthorized persons in the cashier area. You can have friends come and visit, but you should net if, if that's okay with your supervisor, but don't let them behind where the cash is. And then have good lighting. If there is a place that you think is really dark where you're taking money, try to have 
the, the facility department come and give you some more lighting. Do not count cash in a public open space. If you can, if you have a lot of cash, you need to go back behind somewhere and count it back there so the public doesn't see all this money out there. It's just not a good thing. And then if you do have to go and take money to the, to the treasurer's office or to the bank, don't go the same time every day. Um, that's just a safety thing. Procedures to follow during a robbery. So at this point in time, we've never had a robbery from Springville City, but you never know. And it's always good to be prepared. The preservation of human life and health. The cash handlers and the co-workers and the public. Catching the criminal and the preservation of city funds. Preservation of life and safety is the highest priority. Okay, we want to catch the criminal, not stop the crime. Assume there is a weapon. Be polite and accommodating. Keep talking to the robber. Do exactly as the robber asks. Attempt no heroics. Observe the robber, but don't stare. Watch over all the evidence left by the robber. So if the robber touches the counter, puts his hand down on the counter, then you, you remember that. You remember where he put the, what they did with their hands. And then listen to the voice. See if you can hear any names, slangs, and so on. After the robber requests have been satisfied, volunteer to lay down on the floor. And then do not leave the premises or call 911 until it is safe to do so. Okay, procedures to follow after a robbery. Lock the premises. So if a robber comes in, you've laid down on the floor, the robber has now taken off out the door, you've locked the premises. And then you notify your supervisor, and then you call 911 and you stay on the line. And then you don't speak to no anyone other than city officials. So if somebody comes up that has been in the, at the premises and they come up and say, what happened, what's going on, you do not talk to them. You only talk to city officials. Okay, fire and bomb threat. You secure all money. Protecting people is of greater importance than retrieving city funds. A few years ago, in the old city building, there was, I came in to, to work. I went in to the safe and I got all our money out for the day, but I started to smell gas. And the gas was really, really strong. So I called the fire department and they came over and they just come in and they said, evacuate immediately. And I didn't have time, nor should I have locked the money away. So I, they said evacuate immediately, so I did. And um, the outside the door, one of the pine trees had fallen over onto the gas meter and there was gas shooting up in the air. If I had even done a switch, turned off a light or anything, it could have exploded the whole building. So it's, it's important that you take care, you worry about human life first. And then don't try to remove the funds from the premises. No matter what, leave the funds there. If we know what funds are there, insurance companies may reimburse us. If you try to take the funds out of the building, then you, it may get in the mix-up, it may get lost, it may get stolen, and then you would be responsible for that. So always leave the funds. And personal judgment is critical. If you have time and you can lock up the funds in a safe, then you can do so. But if in the case that I had where they said evacuate immediately, I did not. There was only city, city officials in the building, so it was okay. But it took a couple hours before we were able to get the gas turned off and it was safe to go back into the building. So make sure that you use your judgment on that. But you need to remember that safety is the most important thing. Your department should have emergency procedures in case of a fire or natural disaster. Hopefully your supervisor has a plan of what to do if there is a fire, if there is an earthquake. Hopefully you all have a plan of where you're supposed to meet so everyone can be accounted for. But that is something that your supervisor would arrange for. But if that happens, if there is a, 
earthquake or whatever, don't try to, to, to lock up the money. Don't ever take it out of the premises and make sure that you use your good judgment. That's the end of our training. There'll be a few questions to answer and then you will have been certified and trained by the City of Springville for cash handling. Almost you get 105%, right? Yeah. <laughs>